International delegations arriving in Nicaragua ahead of the official swearing-in ceremony of President Daniel Ortega. Cuba has vaccinated almost 10 million people against COVID-19, that is 87% of its entire population. Russia told the United States that it had no plans to invade Ukraine as the two sides held talks in the Swiss capital amid escalating tensions. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Nicaragua where international delegations are arriving for the inauguration ceremony of President-elect Daniel Ortega. Ortega will be sworn in for a fifth term this Monday evening after his landslide re-election in the November 7th polls with more than 76% of the vote. The swearing-in ceremony will take place in Revolution Square, northwest of the capital, Managua. Delegations from at least 21 countries, including heads of state and foreign ministers, are set to attend, including from Mexico, Belize, Cuba, Bolivia, Venezuela, China, Palestine, Iran, Russia, India, Turkey, Vietnam, Angola, Syria and Egypt. Cuban President Miguel Díaz-Canel arrived in Managua earlier in the day to attend the inauguration of a key ally. We're very happy once again to arrive in Nicaraguan soil, a sister nation, a friendly country, and people we know, and in the name of the Cuban people, the government, and Army General Raul Castro, we want to convey to the Nicaraguan people all our congratulations for the magnificent victory achieved on November 7. This is a victory not only for Nicaragua, but it has an immense significance for the left forces and for the progressive governments of Latin America and the Caribbean. It is a victory that at the same time shows the anti-imperialist conviction of the Nicaraguan people and also their decision to continue advancing the deep political, social and economic transformations that have been carried out by the government of reconciliation and national unity, at the head of which is our brother and commander, Daniel Ortega y Saavedra. Hux for Nicaragua. And to discuss the inauguration of President Daniel Ortega this Monday and its significance for Nicaragua, we now welcome journalist, political analyst, activist and organiser of the Convu Couch, Fiorella Mallorca. Thank you so much for joining us today, Fiorella. Hi, thank you for having me. Fiorella, what does another Daniel Ortega presidential term mean for Nicaragua? Uh, Nicaraguans are largely supportive of the president, uh, Daniel Ortega, unlike what you hear in mainstream media, especially Western and uh, U.S. and, and NATO-backed media. We just heard this morning that the United States Department of Treasury has issued new sanctions for Nicaragua, specifically for diplomats and high-ranking military officials, which was something that we could see was coming. However, uh, it kind of shows just how impactful geopolitically this whole situation will be. We have the president of uh, Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, arriving. President of Cuba, uh, Miguel Diaz Canal, also arriving. And so what we're seeing here is a new era of affiliations with Iran, China, and Russia in a time where the United States is experiencing drastic and dire economic policies. Nicaragua is building, it's rebuilding, it's expanding. There is talk of a potential canal being built that would absolutely change the trade and the economic uh, possibilities of the entire Central American region. Fiorella Ortega was re-elected with over 76% of the vote in November and the Sandinista National Liberation Front also secured another landslide victory, increasing its parliamentary majority. How can we explain this rising support even in the midst of the attacks by some domestic sectors and by Western powers against the Nicaraguan government, as you've mentioned? Right. So being with a delegation, I have traveled to uh, certain parts of Nicaragua where there was so much poverty prior to Daniel Ortega's government and the FSLN. And that has changed drastically in the last few years. For example, Bilwi is a autonomous zone in the Caribbean north of the country, and that is full of indigenous people that speak different languages. And they experienced back to back hurricanes of category four and five. And they really talked about relying on the Ortega government for rebuilding. They got their houses rebuilt and a lot of the schools are being rebuilt as we speak. Meanwhile, you compare Puerto Rico in the United States where disaster capitalism takes place and investors from, uh, you know, wealthy investors go in there and they exploit the country's resources. And we see a completely different situation. Also in Nicaragua, what we're seeing is a push for 
taking care of its people. We visited a, a Bismarck uh, Mar uh, Martinez Center. It was a center where people were allowed to have housing and it was a very, very uh, low cost housing. Two thirds was covered by the government. Only one third was covered by the people and people were speaking about that excitedly. Nicaragua has by far the best roads in the Americas. There are roads in the United States right now that are far worse than anything I've seen here in Nicaragua. And so I, I really have a hard time seeing the quote unquote reports from the so-called journalists of the mainstream media, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all, all Reuters today just talking about Daniel Ortega being an oppressor and, and talking about journalism when once again, we're seeing the persecution of journalists by the State Department, including journalists like Julian Assange, who is still sitting in Balmarsh prison as we speak. Fiorella, you mentioned there the sanctions, but what are the challenges going forward for the Nicaraguan government? Right, so sanctions are an act of siege warfare. Unfortunately, sanctions have affected many of the Latin American countries. We've seen them affect Cuba. We've seen them affect Venezuela. The one thing I will say about Nicaragua is they have been preparing for this moment. Nicaragua is largely self-sufficient. A lot of the materials that they use for construction and for other parts of sectors, including agriculture, they, they use from their own. So while sanctions will absolutely affect the country, Nicaraguans are prepared to be self-sufficient. And we have seen that through the cooperatives and the agricultural regions like and organizations like the ATC, which have helped kind of bring back an interest and an investment of the people into the rural economy, into agriculture, not just urbanization. So I think in the difference between Nicaragua and Venezuela and other countries is that Nicaragua has learned from others and is preparing itself, is expecting these sanctions. So they're going to know how to proceed, as well as making alliances with now China by recognizing uh, China over Taiwan. And so what we're seeing is they're ready to make these business deals that are going to help uh, bring them up while dealing with these disastrous sanctions. Fiorella Mallorca is a journalist, a political analyst and an activist. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your insight into this important day for Nicaragua and, as you say, for the rest of the region. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Brazil faces a housing crisis with the federal government cutting its public housing budget by 98%. However, social movements and left-wing local authorities are working to address the deficit. Our correspondent Brian Mir reports. During 14 years of Workers' Party rule, the Brazilian federal government spent billions of dollars on self-managed autonomous housing construction in partnership with working class social movements. Since the 2016 coup, however, most of these projects have been paralyzed as the Bolsonaro administration cut its housing budget by 98%. Our constitution says we have the right to housing, but in reality we don't see it happening. The pandemic isn't just affecting housing. Groceries have gotten really expensive and we squatted on vacant land because families are having to choose between eating or paying rent. The housing crisis has caused left-wing mayors across the country to take matters into their own hands. After 150 families from the MLB social movement squatted on an empty lot in Diadema, Sao Paulo, the mayor's office announced it will close an illegal parking lot and build ownership-based housing for the families on it. In the meantime, it's providing 18 months of financial support to the social movement. The end of the federal social housing program directly affected the social movement and the families that can no longer afford to pay rent. So we created a municipal program to support housing movements. We're going to strengthen the movements with so they can support poor families. Brazilian Workers' Party mayors and people's housing movements hope that they can work together to reduce Brazil's deficit of 6 million housing units. Brian Mir, tell us, sir, Diadema. 
Chile's electoral tribunal this Monday officially proclaimed Gabriel Boric president-elect following his victory in the December elections. In a simple ceremony, the official proclamation of Boric's electoral victory was signed by the corresponding authorities before it was read out to those attending. The proclamation was then handed over to the president-elect, confirming that he would serve the four-year constitutional period beginning on March 1, 2022. Following the ceremony, Boric offered a press conference during which he stressed the importance of passing the pardon bill for the political prisoners detained in the major anti-government unrest of 2019. Cuba has vaccinated almost 10 million people against COVID-19, that is 87% of its entire population. The health ministry reported that more than 31 million of the country's domestically produced Soberana O2, Soberana Plus and Abdallah shots have been administered to date, as the booster campaign advances with 10 million doses already applied. The Finlay Vaccine Institute, responsible for the production of the vaccines, has assured that by the end of January, the entire target population will have received their booster dose against the coronavirus. Cuba is the first Latin American nation to produce its own vaccines, which have proven to be highly effective in protecting from COVID complications and has provided doses to several nations. Ugandan children have returned to school after nearly two years. The country ended the world's longest school closure on Monday, ordering millions of students back to the classroom nearly two years after in-person learning was suspended because of the coronavirus pandemic. Students poured through school gates that were shut in March 2020 when COVID-19 swept the globe, greeting teachers and friends after 83 weeks outside the classroom. All schools have implemented guidelines and standard operating procedures to ensure the safe return of students, and measures have been put in place to ensure those who don't comply do so. But for some parents, the return to school has been difficult after the economic pain caused by pandemic curfews and lockdowns. Uh, schools that are within the city or within the towns, some of them had the opportunity maybe to get some study materials. And they did something for some time, but when it is not well supervised still, you'll find that um, they might have studied but not to the best of their ability. Uh, with the schools up country, uh, some of them did not study anything completely. And we have taken two years without coming to school, but now I'm very happy to see my children coming back to get there, to see the children back and uh, to get their friends. They have been missing them. Feeling today. I am happy because I was missing my teachers and my study. India has launched its booster campaign as Omnicom cases soar. Booster shots were rolled out for frontline workers and vulnerable people on Monday as authorities grapple with a rapidly escalating outbreak driven by the new variant. Daily case numbers are approaching the enormous figures seen last year with nearly 180,000 new infections recorded overnight, up nearly six times from a week earlier, with several urban centres imposing nighttime curfews and restrictions on public gatherings. People aged 60 and above with pre-existing medical conditions, health professionals and other essential workers are eligible for a booster nine months after their second jab. We are happy that uh, we have started with the precaution doses. So with seeing the number of spike and increase in cases nowadays, it's necessary that uh, we start protecting our population uh, more uh, better, in a better way. So we are happy that we are doing it now. My advice is that every people, every citizen of everywhere, of every country in the world should get vaccinated. It is a, uh, Modi government which is helpful, very helpful to the, its people and also the people around the world that we are supplying vaccination to other parts of the world also. Every people should get benefit from the vaccine. The United Nations launched talks this Monday to help Sudan solve its escalating political crisis triggered by last year's military coup, which has seen ongoing protests and repression. In fact, we are acting as facilitators. We have presented a project for facilitating talks between the Sudanese people and the Sudanese parties through us, which means the talks will be indirect, and that is why we have come to say that we are here to consult with you. If things progress well, 
we might be able to reach an agreement on certain points. We might reach a stage where we can say that we're ready to move to another phase. And the roundtable that the Prime Minister Abdallah Hardom spoke of when he stepped down is still available. We're here just facilitating. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Formal talks between Russia and United States officials were held on Monday in the midst of escalating tensions. Russia told the United States that it had no plans to invade Ukraine, contrary to the repeated allegations voiced by Western powers and echoed in the mass media. After more than seven hours of negotiations in the Swiss capital, the Russian and U.S. negotiators both offered to keep talking that there was no sign of a major breakthrough. The talks come as Moscow demands that Washington and its NATO allies stop the military encirclement of Russia and work to prevent a possible escalation of the conflict in neighboring Ukraine. Meanwhile, Washington continues to threaten more sanctions. It hasn't revealed any new issues. These issues are well known. But I think uh, what uh, uh, has happened now, uh, these issues are uh, um, on the radar uh, of everybody and they are uh, on uh, the discussion and hopefully soon also on the negotiation table. And, and that is important. And in that sense, uh, for me, that is uh, uh, the progress is important uh, to um, identify measures that allow to uh, rebuild trust in the short term. And uh, again, I think uh, these measures uh, in the area of military risk reduction, um, of strengthening confidence and security building measures would allow to do that uh, and also provide time to tackle these more fundamental issues. Addressing member states of the Collective Security Treaty Organization on Monday, President of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamat Tokayev, assured that constitutional order has been restored and a foreign-backed coup attempt frustrated. The military alliance, which sent peacekeeping troops to Kazakhstan following the request from the president in the face of violent unrest, assessed the developments in Kazakhstan and the eff efforts made by the bloc in ensuring regional stability. The Kazakh president also announced that January 10th would be observed as a day of national mourning for the victims of the violence. Tokayev has assured that what started out as peaceful protests against fuel price rises spiraled into destabilization attempts and terrorist attacks by foreign trained sleeper cells. Some sources talk about the fight between Kazakhstan authorities and peaceful protesters. This is absolute disinformation. We have never fired and will never fire on peaceful demonstrators. 16 employees of power structures were killed. More than 1,300 were injured. Unfortunately, there are also casualties among the civilian population. The exact number is being specified. Very soon, the large-scale anti-terrorist operation will come to an end, and with it will end the successful and efficient mission of the CSTO. Iran's foreign ministry said Monday that efforts by all parties to revive the country's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers had resulted in good progress during the talks in Vienna. This progress is the result of the efforts made by all parties to reach a stable agreement. There has been good progress on all four issues of removing sanctions, nuclear issues, verification and obtaining guarantees. We are seeking a reliable and stable deal. If the other party thinks an unstable and unreliable agreement is to their benefit, this is not what the Islamic Republic is after. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tele So English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.